Hey there, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good. If anybody wants to go, I have it. If you don't like spearmint, then I probably won't like it though. It's still snowing out there, just like the occasional flake coming down. Like, I don't really want to drive back. It was like, look, which I doubt will have to do that. I could always manifest from the spot, yes. No, I don't think we're getting any blizzard conditions today. No. Thursday, I saw we were supposed to get some kind of. Yeah, Thursday could get a little interesting, too. Yeah. I don't think we're going to say so. Right, right, there you go. Miss all the bad stuff. We're gonna fly out to DC tomorrow, and usually when we go to DC in February, we bring a massive snowstorm with us, and oh. they're not so good at handling snow. Yeah. Uh, so I was kind of relieved to see the forecast was falling for pretty clear skies while I'm gonna be there. <laughs> nice. How long are you guys there? Oh, just a couple of days. Okay. We fly in for some committee meetings and some hill visits and, you know, raw raw for farmers and mm -hmm. head on back. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Brian. All right. Trying to, you know, juggle the chainsaws. I, I heard the cats. I don't know what's the best expression. <laughs> it's winter meeting season, so yeah. Oh, tomorrow's after Wednesday. Yeah, good. Huh. Wait, that means we have to Right, other duties as assigned. Right. Yeah. Like this morning. I got the challenge of try to find a reservation for 18 people for dinner for Valentine's Day evening in downtown Washington, D.C. <laughs> tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, oh then tomorrow, is it? Yep. And that was that was like mostly the responses that I got was you do know tomorrow's Valentine's Day, right? I was like, yeah. Yeah, I do know that. <laughs> I'm aware. I hear how silly what I'm saying sounded. Right? <laughs> but just work with me here that I'm going after this impossible task. Summary <laughs> serves restrooms. Yes, back down toward the kind of middle hallway branch there. The elevators in the middle. A yeah. part of the building by the floor. The elevators that fool you because they don't go to the main floor in the middle. <laughs> Did you just say where the rest of it is? Yeah, uh, back down the hallway this way, and then uh, they'll be right by the elevators. Yeah, I don't know. I can't Hey, Dave, can you hear us? Yeah. Uh, yes, I can. That's not. We expect to be able to continue. We're good. Thank you. That's going to happen, but.
No, and like this one, we just do the overall because I didn't see what Hey, Clay. Hey, Clay. Hey, Jill. How are you doing? Good. <laughs> you look, How are you? You look well good. You look like you're getting ready to be in charge. Yeah, I guess so. I'm running the show. It's yeah. my turn to fail. No, no, no. You're going to do fine. <laughs> I'll turn my uh, mic off or whatever. So, but yeah, you hang in yeah, there. You're going to do fine. I know you will. Thanks. Luckily, we tested it last figured week, it so I think we oh. figured it out. Well, that's good. <laughs> that helps too. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's amazing. Actual, yeah. But, you know, that's, I guess, what it is. They're more expensive. But trying to keep these projects competitive is hard. Well, there, you know, you know, the money starts to mix in my personal. Hey, good. How are you? Hey, James. How are you? I'm doing well. Yeah, it's nice to kind of. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I was kind of supporting last week, so I can even down here. I'm thinking, like, you know, for everything right now, people actually ask me if I live there because I'm so familiar with the community that showing them all around. I should have offered them one punch yeah. to get that form while it's right here. Right? Yeah, like, I, like, I feel like we just need to start doing some kind of bribery. Yeah, some kind of bribery. Yeah, Right. Yeah. Good job. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. Mm -hmm. sure. I don't want to face forward. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Lower King Z, so eight I zero seven or C seven. Is that a capital C? Yes. Yes. Two to three miles on. Yes. Yes. That's still not let me in. It's a username. What? Username is G Y R S. Yeah. Let me look. I wrote it down at one point earlier today. Oh, wait, mine. I think, I think mine is working. I think it works. We need to just. Or if you're European. Do from uppercase C. Uppercase C. But we got an exclamation point. Yep. And then you have She's like formerly. I was also upset this morning when I got here and I was straight. She's using this. Okay. And then finally, you use it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yes. You can come up to the big kids table, Phil. So. Oh. <laughs> if you would like. Or you can hang out with the cool kids here. I'll hang out with you. I think it's Most of you in the room with laptops. If you haven't already, if you can mute your speakers other than Clay, okay. then we won't have feedback. Hopefully. Some of those names. Okay. Just get another piece of Yeah, uh, yeah, you're going to do 
I'm seven, eight. Yeah. So this is the first part. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Y
Yeah, I doubt it. What there? Don't know if there's going to be snow. We're supposed to yeah. have them this year. Right. We said, no, all right, we've got two weeks to cancel for our Zoom. And that we answered the phone. Oh, we didn't hear that. And then we all left that. Oh, that's And then it's done. That's what we're hoping. It stays on the other end. But it's in cash. We're just trying to make some ice cream. Yeah. Nice to meet you. 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 Nice to did you drive yourself here? <laughs> no, this is We've got a lot more coming down some stairs, but yeah. otherwise, I think we're good to go. Okay. I, I don't yeah. think we're What's that? Does it depend on who it is coming in? Because even if that will only be a, even if it is somebody who's a voting member. What is the magic number? Nine. Nine. If we were allowed to count the folks logging in online, we would always have to go back. <laughs> If anybody from the attorney general's office happens to be online listening. <laughs> that would be from the legislature. Yeah. <laughs> well, since we're a split personality, we come in handy. Right, but who gets to go to the legislature and argue for that? Is it you guys or is it the attorney general's office to say, please change this so that we can go back to the COVID era. We're meeting in person and virtual as a hybrid and everything counts for quorum. I mean, because yeah. if it's you, we need to go have some coffee and talk about this. <laughs> Waiting for the you know, mood of the legislature to be more open to that argument. I think maybe we let it sit I for a little while longer. Increase in access and justice for all. How can you not agree with that? I am there. <laughs> We're embracing our virtual world. Yeah. Is this you being recorded? Hang your crowd. Yes, yeah. it is. <laughs> you betcha. <laughs> so and not yet. <laughs> yes, it is. We're, yeah, we've, we've been recording for about ten minutes. So anybody who said anything off color, you are now memorialized forever. <laughs> Just checking. I always assume the mic is hot. <laughs> <laughs> also true. Also true. Right, exactly. Not hard to keep minutes, but it is on the recording. <laughs> We can start in not every um, minutes, right? And then she come back to that point. Yeah, Where, where's this person coming down this? I mean, it's not that long of a trip. Yeah. There we go. Through Constitution, I kind of went to see what we wanted. Yes. Hey, folks online, thanks for your thanks for your patience. We're, uh, we're getting our last couple folks in the room here, and then we will go ahead and get started. Oh. No. 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 No, <laughs> we're excited to have you. <laughs> <laughs> we're excited to have you. It's just that we were hoping for, you know, forum. We're, I think we're still one short. <laughs> well, if everybody's set. And ready with the with the recording. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks for your patience, everybody. We'll uh, keep fingers crossed that everything works today with the technology. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're hosting the Water Use Advisory Council meeting here at Constitution Hall. Uh, my name is Laura Campbell, and I'm one of your tri chairs for the council. Uh, and we'll uh, just start rolling right through the beginning of our agenda. Um, we do not, as it happens, have quorum in the room for today. 
Um, so while I am going to ask folks in the room to go around and do roll call, um, and we'll acknowledge the folks in the recording who are uh, participating online, um, what we will do is we will ask if there are agenda items and we will ask if anybody has uh, amendments that they need to make to the minutes, but those will not be officially accepted until the next meeting that we have in which we have in person quorum. So we'll uh, so we'll go through it for the sake of making sure that we've got stuff <clears throat> written down for the purposes of the meeting and for transparency. But again, this is not uh, an official quorum meeting in which we can make uh, make official voting approvals on anything. So with that, uh, what I'll do is I'll start with asking folks in the room to go ahead and identify yourselves, especially for our folks online who may not be able to see everyone so well. Jim, do you mind if we start with you? We'll sure. just go around the room and then around the outside. Jim Mellon, Water Use Assessment Unit Supervisor, Eagle Water Resources Division. James Lift, uh, Eagle Deputy Director. Uh, Dave Hamilton, retired from the Nature Conservancy. Megan Tinsley, Michigan Environmental Council. Megan Napier, AKT Gerlis. Emily Fennell. Eagle Great Falls of Great Lakes, Great Lakes Senior Advisor and Strategist. Brian Burroughs with Travel Unlimited, representing statewide angler groups. Pat Stask Evans, American Waterworks, representing all water supplies. Katie Lindstrom with Fire Engineering Company. Doug Needham with the Aggregate Association. Uh, Bree Hannantry with Jack Ho. Rex Vaughn, Michigan Lakes and Streams. I'm Dave McTurrin's alternate. Lady Jufree, Eagle, Terrell, Michigan Farm Group. Go around the outside. Austin York, Eagle, Quality Use Assessment Unit. Ross Almer, Eagle, Quality Use Assessment Unit. Hey, Mayor, Eagle, Quality Use Assessment Unit. Yeah, no, Arna, Eagle. Hello, Arna, Eagle, Eagle, Water Resource Visit. Go on, Andy LeBaron, Eagle Water Me. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. And um, Clay, you've got the folks who are online participating. Uh, as recorded here, so we'll go ahead and jump right in through our agenda. Um, again, I will uh, I will ask if there's any items that anybody needs to add to today's agenda. And feel free to unmute and go ahead and just shout out. Kind of switching hey, Laura, back this and forth. Is, Laura, this is oh. Kelly Turner. Um, is it possible to add to the report section from committees uh, how the uh, work with MSU is going on water user committees? I think it would be good to have an update on that at every meeting. Do we have somebody here who's able to provide any, any information on that? I don't think we've got any MSU folks here. Let's see if we've got any online. Uh, but uh, I think I think Emily is overseeing that as a uh, possibility. She that. gave the report last time. I don't know if she's able to give that report today, um, or if we can just make an appointment like every time we have a meeting that it gets added onto the report. Because I think that project started in the new topics committee, but then it kind of got moved off to the side, and so we need to have a way to kind of capture what's happening there. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Emily, are you? I can give a short update, but I don't have all the details to give any detailed update today. Okay. Uh, Yansuk, are you are, are you involved with that project at all, or that you're able to provide any details that Emily hasn't got? No? Okay. No. All right. Well, we'll get what we can from Emily, and that's a good suggestion, Kelly. Um, we'll, uh, we'll plan on adding that as an item on the agenda for future meetings, if you don't mind doing that. Sure. Right. All right. I think I always invite the uh, yeah. research lead team team lead. Sorry, Jim. we could invite the research MSU research team lead to attend future council meetings to provide updates. And I've had that conversation with Dr. Adam Circle, who's leading the project. I okay. talked with Pat um, earlier in January about having him do that. So I'll need to get with Adam to see what his availability is for the next meeting. Um, I don't know what, if our Five monthly meetings make sense, but we can figure out what frequency. Okay. So they have something to share. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Kelly. We'll we'll add that to the agenda. Anything else that anybody needs to add to today's agenda? Uh, 
I have a question for probably heading into the new tapas committee. When we get to that okay. part. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Hearing no others. Um, again, we're not going to officially approve the meeting minutes from December 13th, but if anybody's got any edits or corrections you'd like to make, we, de we definitely do want to make sure we capture those before it's been too long and then people forget what they were going to say. I know, it, just one typo um, on page six. Eagle okay. was spelled wrong, like the bird. Oh, um, yeah, it could yeah. be confusing, probably won't, right? <laughs> Thanks, word autocorrect. <laughs> Be easier if you guys just went back to DEQ. I mean, I'm just saying, acting <laughs> division director there and deputy director. Any other amendments to the minutes? Okay, we will make a note that the next time we uh, the next time we meet, uh, as soon as we have in person quorum, we'll we'll uh, put it on the agenda to make sure that we approve. The minutes from December 13th so that we don't lose track of that. Um, at this time, I'll go ahead and move on to the next agenda item for public comment. And remembering for, for those, uh, most of you, I think, are probably familiar with, uh, with how we do public comment here. We have two public comment periods. The first one we try to reserve for agenda items. And the second one, which will appear at the end of the agenda, is going to be for open topics. So does anyone have public comment about agenda items for today? And again, just go ahead and mute and, uh, and unmute and and, uh, and shout out so that I don't miss someone raising their hand. All right, hearing none, um, we'll jump into uh, a quick discussion on strategizing how to connect with leadership and legislators on budget items. Um, as you guys know, the uh, the 2023 budget uh, that was approved by the legislature didn't include uh, funding for the additional recommendations that this council made, uh, which is understandable because with new leadership and a lot of new legislators in office, they had a lot of stuff to get through, and uh, you know it, it was not going to not. I want to say the discussions that we had, we were we were told. We'll get to you. <laughs> um, so we do want to make sure that we're still continuing to push for that uh, and to push for those uh, those funding recommendations that we did make from 2022. Uh, some of the things that we've talked about have been uh, providing all of you guys as a council with some talking points that even if the legislator in your district is not on the appropriations committee, we want we want you to be able to have those talking points available so that you can contact your legislator. Every contact does help. Um, but also we have talked about um, scheduling some time uh, with the uh, with the executive committee yes. to get some meetings on the books with uh, with those appropriations chairs, as well as inviting in other folks uh, if we're able to get those get those meetings scheduled or get some time during an upcoming appropriations hearing uh, to be able to get some additional folks in to testify. Um, and Brian, I know you and I had talked this morning. I don't know if you were able to follow up with Dave or not with with Rex being here today, um, but we did talk about I know Dave's got a lot of interest in participating in that process. We just got to get Dave comfortable with walking on water that's hard so he can be here to help. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Understandable. Yeah, that, that, yeah when, when water is hard in Michigan, I guess my face will be here when it's sunny and warm. Dave will be back. All right. All right. Understandable. Yeah, we know some some folks have a pretty long drive to get here. Um, James, we had also talked about uh, with uh, with Chris Alexander to see if there might be an opportunity for us to tag team on with Eagle's presentation to the Appropriations Committee for Water Use Advisory Council recommendations. Do you know if if Chris or if anybody else has had those conversations yet? Yeah. Well, the presentations to the legislature today and this Thursday are our very first intro presentations and the committee chairs kind of control how many meetings they want, how many topics they want to cover. So um, I think now that we're getting the first one to our belt, we might get a better idea of how many meetings are they having, are they going to have one specifically on the Water Use Advisory Council. Again, people can always 
uh, contact the church directly if it's you know a desire. But again, I haven't heard yet whether or not they plan to schedule one on the topic or not yet. But again, mm-hmm. we don't usually hear until just about right now when they start to set yep. their schedule for the uh, subcommittees. Okay. Are are we, are we even in the discussion? I mean, is is the water use advisory council recommendations even a possibility they know that they have a hearing on? Where to hear from? That's what we need to get more information on is to find out whether or not they're willing to hear it. Um, when we when we had the discussion on the 2020 recommendations, we got we approached it a couple different ways. So we approached them independently as the as the tri chairs to say, hey, we have recommendations. But then also when Eagle was giving kind of its little bit in depth, you know, here's everything that Eagle is looking for in the budget. Uh, we were actually allowed to come in and kind of do a, you know, do an addition onto the end of their presentation to cover water use advisory council topics. And so I'm hoping for a repeat of that because, you know, we struck gold last time. I'd, I'd like to I'd like to do that again, particularly since the ask isn't as big. In my experience, chairs have always been open to taking, you know, committee testimony on any topic that a member of the public wants to talk about. So if you contact the chair, you'll be given <laughs> some opportunity to address the subcommittees, but my experience. Um, Brian, since you've been trying to reach out to Dave about that, do you want to continue that effort and then see where we're... I'll figure out um, how much Dave can do from the bar and I'll fill in and we'll get going. I mean, it's... James is being good. It's... Um, We've we've sent the 2022 report on several occasions. You should not be so massive as to expect them to go. Well, yeah, let's have those folks come in. Yeah, no, we should definitely try to get some time. Anybody them. works at. Um, so we we should be reaching out and, and asking if we can present on it and uh, seeing if we could be given time. If there are strikes in numbers, I'd be glad to uh, get a Dave mask and help show up. Thank at, you. At some door and knock on it with you. So uh, keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. I'll do a little work uh, after this meeting to just try to organize and kind of know. I think I have a pretty good feel for this group and who um, is allowed to and who is more comfortable and has contacts that could be deployed and who, who doesn't. If any of you would like to participate in trying to do some personal level contacts to get attention to the 2022 report level. We did talk in our December meeting, uh, for those of you who are here and remember this, whether or not it might be appropriate to actually appoint a committee uh, to to pursue authorization of that funding. Um, The challenge with that is that we're in a little bit of gray legal territory there Um, because this is a committee that that is made up in part, at least for the ex officio members of Eagle staff that, you know, that it's a, a committee that's, uh, you know, that essentially reports to Eagle. We also need to be very careful that we're that we're not running afoul of any rules that government agencies have about lobbying the legislators. Lobbying and so that and so we're trying to as much as possible keep this a very informal, uh, informal process in terms of not appointing a permanent standing committee or, you know, or anything formal, but we definitely do want to organize our response. So, Brian, if you're willing to head off that effort and let people know what you need from them and, and when, and if you need people to make phone calls, let us know. But if you, if you wouldn't mind taking the lead on that, we'll, we'll try to make sure and get in front of them. Good. All right. And then uh, as far as the one pager goes, we're working on finalizing that right now. So as soon as that's in final form, we'll get it out to all the members of the council. So you can use it uh, either in your publications or to call legislators or, you know, however, However, you feel best would, would work for promotion on your ends for those of you who are uh, who are permitted to go to your legislators on, on behalf of your organizations and ask. And I think, unless there's questions, um, I think that's all I've got for that agenda item. Looking real quick to see if there's anybody who pops up with a with a question online, but otherwise I think we're ready to I got, I got a question. Yes, sir. There's enough folks on this committee that are not government employees, correct? Should that not be the guy, the, the group that goes knocking on down the doors and making the phone calls so that there's no issues for our colleagues that are restricted by yeah. their employment? Absolutely, so, yeah. Yeah, and I might be one shade more sensitive than that. Yes, none of the none of the agency employees are going to be expected to do any um, real communications. By statute, we're appointed to make recommendations to the executive and the legislative branches. So 
Um, we have the engagement of Eagle. They have our report. We're pretty comfortable. They know what we've recommended and why. Um, <clears throat> the legislative front, most of the member groups are here because they either represent a very um, well, a representative group or a specific skill set and perspective. Um, but even within that, there are you know different groups that are formulated in different ways and have different comfort and practices. So um, I would tell you that out of all the official water council members, I don't expect it to be 100% of those that are uh, comfortable and equipped to do ad active advocacy. And you know, Michigan laws of what's lobbying and what's advocacy is pretty weird. Yeah, you got to protect your 501c3 status. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, but even within that, there's there's little things, right? So yeah, just don't it, endorse a candidate. No, nah, <laughs> it can be a little bit more than that, even. So I'll, I'll work with all of you if you're interested. Um, there's little differences. So if the the legislative uh, committee invited a presentation on the 2022 recommendations, if they invite that and you participate. It's not fun. If we request and say we're going to show up and give testimony, we, we have a right to sign a card and give some testimony. If it's not invited, that's lobbying and it just needs to be recorded. And, and there's groups that are, you know, very versed in that. There's groups that are a little less comfortable. I'll work with anybody who's interested in playing a role and trying to see if we can put a little push behind being able to work on these 22 recommendations. But I don't expect everybody to be comfortable um, in that space. So. If that makes sense. All right. All right. Ready to turn it over to you. Sure. Committee reports. Uh, I think data committees first up. So I'll say that um, data committee will meet next week on the 23rd from 11 to 1. Um, we'll be sending out. Oh, there's already a sort of a safer date in people's calendars. We'll be sending out a, a Zoom meeting link and uh, a rough agenda of what we're going to talk about. And then we're still trying to figure out the rest of a sequence of future meetings. Got to try to figure out whether we settle on a bunch of individual dates or whether there's something that would work for a reoccurring um, time period to have them. Uh, the discussions next week, if you're interested, is really going to be about um, a couple different pathways into just getting better coordinated and strategic on all of the types of data needs that we have. So, um, one topic that we mentioned last meeting is uh, an RFP of the long term data planning, which we mentioned is what we used and phrased it as in the last uh, 2020 report. That just means that back then we had all said what we'd really like to do is to really get in specific detail about all the types of data that people collect, that the program could utilize, where we have it, where we don't have it, and then prioritize how much of different types of data and where in the state we should go after and how much it will cost to acquire. That was kind of the very logical approach to saying, you know, in the future, here's what we need money for. Um, things don't work sequentially sometimes, and we found ourselves with that request out and a, a financial request to do that process, but then we had a lot of the federal funding opportunities that came to the state. and. Um, there was a lot of different sort of pieces to the data acquisition that got forwarded and some have moved, some haven't. Um, overall, not to the degree that we'd all like. So we're now working to get that long term data planning process underway, but we also know that we're not just going to stop and wait because the world doesn't do that. So, for an example, like groundwater monitoring. Um, there is some effort to expand that. There's several different groups that are trying to fill those roles that could use some coordination. Um, in addition to talking about, you know, how to move past just what we have the money for in the first round on that. So um, we'll be talking kind of a mix of things. Number one, I think most important is that we address getting the RFP going and all set up to do the official process. Number two, make sure the right entities are in there and talking about breaking off some of the individual types of data and seeing if we can coordinate and get some better visions, uh, strategic visions developed. And then um, I've also had a conversation or two with a few different members that were given some input for um, what they might like to see the data uh, committee do in the future. And so 
mostly those all fall into the bucket of what we've talked about where even within the data that we often know about different data types, we may still have work to do to iron out the specific protocols. You need either the methods of collection, um, and then once you have the data, what do you need to use and do to it in order to make it fully usable inside the program? And we've, we've worked on that to some degree, but we still have a lot of work on that too. So I'll just say that you know we'll have a meeting next week. We'll dig in on some of that, and then we'll be setting up future agendas for some regular meetings, hopefully. And um, that's what we'll be doing. Just for clarification, so the funding from the 2020 recommendation did come through, so that money is there. So we're talking about creating an RFP that then would go out for bid, and so we get somebody to come in and do the work. We just need to specify what exactly is that work that we would like to do. Yep, and a lot of that was was done by Jim and Lena. Um, they got a great draft. They shared it with uh, Megan and I to start. Uh, we think of what we'll present to the rest of the group will be. Pretty good. Um, and that, that's also will lead us into other discussions because even for that effort, um, it was, I think, total of $200,000 towards it. So there's certain things that we discussed and we'll explain in the meeting that to be cost efficient with a proposal, that there's a lot of it that we can do and have ready for them. And then there's things at the end of the project that we'll do that we probably shouldn't pass. You. So ultimately, we'll have prioritization discussions needed that only, you know, our group is really appropriate with all the different interests in the group. But there's some prep work, too. Um, there's no need to, between the group, everybody who participates in this, we don't need to just tell a, a <clears throat> consultant from the scratch, hey, can you identify all the sources of data that we like to use? Because this group pretty much knows at this point all the sources that are available. So. There'll be work that we can do that that we're envisioning to streamline the proposal to make sure that we get bids and budget, and also do our part in supporting the project. Sounds good. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Models committee. All right. So um, we have a we have work groups that are set up and ready to go for the 2020 recommendations. We're waiting with bated breath to see who gets the contracts and grants and whatever. So I'm looking for the Jim's report to see. But we're we're ready to go whenever they are. Um let's see here. We have a work group that's um working on the app for performance test uh, forever, it seems. And um we've uh, we're waiting on some language from some of the consultants to try to see if we can finalize language in that report. So I think we're close, but I've thought that a couple of times and we'll we'll see. Uh, but so we are waiting on some input on that. Uh, we uh, set up a work group on the technical issues that go around with site specific review. So we had the meeting, we had the presentation at our last meeting. And as you could tell, there were a number of issues that came up during that process, surfaced during that process. So we have set up a work group now to uh, work on that. So we are finalizing the membership. We're still looking for another person or two. Uh, we set ground rules and we set a list of topics. Just let me just kind of summarize them for you so you have a feel for what this group will be doing. So um, while we already have a work group working at our performance test, Kind of holding the space there. If there's any issues that are very technical, that that group doesn't finalize success, family writing guidance. But if there are technical issues that we think we should dig into, we will. We'll, we'll wait for that group to finish their work to see what's what's left. Uh, we're going to look into uh, how to best interpolate uh, lithology between adjacent wells. If, um, there's um, you know, sometimes there's differences of interpretation, so we're going to look for the common ground as to uh, provide some guidance on that. And when uh, additional monitoring wells or drilling are needed to define the lithology, uh, that is very site specific, but we thought we could uh, uh, do maybe a bit of a roadmap to, uh, to uh, uh, help people on that topic because it is a very important topic. The uh, statutory time limits for site specific reviews are really problematic. And I think everybody's involved in the process agrees with that, consultants and 
uh, applicants and everybody agrees so that we're going to look at that and see if we can analyze what's going on there. And we realize there's no way the legislature is going to want to, oh, free falls take as much time as you want, but trying to identify these are conditions where really everybody agrees more time is needed. And we will come to the proposal that we'll bring back to the council to uh, talk about. We'll also talk about practices of uh, how you select various hydraulic characteristics of the uh, groundwater and see consistency and again, common ground. We'll look at 2D analytical models, and uh, there's some issues that have been brought up as to how recovery times work in those models when you have cyclic pumping schedules. So we'll investigate that, and we'll make sure that methods are used in the program that don't artificially uh, increase the depletion estimates. Uh, we will examine the long-term monitoring well data and some <laughs> water and stream flow data for evidence of depletion. We're not going to dig into that detail because we do have a proposal from our last um, a recommendation two years ago that uh, if it's funded, we'll dig into that, but we're going to do some some level of work on that because we need it. And hopefully we'll get the funding to do the, the deeper dive on that. And then we'll discuss the limitations of analytical models based on their inherent assumptions. And we'll talk about uh, when should a numeric model be developed and some general guidance for that. So it's actually a pretty aggressive, ambitious thing. We'll see how we do it. Uh, so we'll look forward to digging into it. And the last thing is that Don Yelich uh, gave a presentation, which was really, really good. Um, the Michigan Geological Survey's got some significant funding. They've been out there working, and uh, he was giving us an idea of what he does. So there's geological data collection. He was giving us some idea of what they do. Uh, clean up well logic, uh, tell us about that. He developed some maps, and the maps are going to become uh, 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 GIS compatible, which is really going to be huge once that happens. So, John, this is going to happen in, in the very near future. So, I'm looking forward to that. Um, I think it may be worth having John come into one of our meetings in the next few months and maybe give a summary of this. Not as necessarily as much stuff as we got in the committee, but uh, I think the council would enjoy his presentation. So, that's all I've got for the models. Great. Thank you. Any questions for the models committee? Oh, one other thing. Uh, in John's uh, presentation, he had a slideshow. So I've got a copy of that. If you'd like it, I'll be glad to give you a copy, or I'm sure John would give you a copy too. Yeah. John, I see your thumbs up. <laughs> How do we get on the list to get that? Talk to me. Excellent. Thank you. At New Topics Committee. Um, well, I guess I'll insert uh, the water users group right here because that's kind of related to the um, three topics because we created that subgroup uh, to talk about uh, water users groups in general. And then the RFP went out. As you recall, we had a presentation to the committee on the survey results, which was the first phase of that um, study. Uh, they have a draft completed of some of the guidance, but that is still under review, and they're working on the pilot communities. Correct. So, do you have more to add from that? Um, yeah, I can just add that uh, a couple of things. So, as Pat and James Clifton and I met in early January, just to talk about timing of, you know, when it would make sense to, and whether it makes sense to bring together that um, subcommittee that was and made that recommendation to the council. And um, we thought from that discussion that it made more sense to really let the research study complete its process and um, uh, be able to come up with its final recommendations, final draft report, uh, and engage with the council throughout the process between now and the time that the project completes. So um, what we were proposing is that uh, we have Dr. Adams Wickle come present to the council uh, on kind of status updates on the project when there's some content to share like he had with the previous findings. Um, and that we would have him uh, share the final draft report from the project, uh, the final draft guidance materials that are developed for forming the water user committees. And there are three of them. So they've created a convener's guide, a facilitator's guide, and a participant's guide. Um, invite the council's review and comment on those documents presented to the council um, and towards the end of the project. 
and then uh, be able to incorporate those comments into the final document. And then at that time, uh, it really would be in the action of the council so that we form a committee to sort of take up those recommendations and findings and the results of that project, um, and then determine next steps and future recommendations that may be needed or resources. Um, so I talked to Adam uh, towards the end of the calendar year and uh, thought that made sense. Um, in terms of just a quick update on the project, the MSU project team has requested a one-year extension, um, which we fully expected that this would be a three-year project. So they've requested that extension through the University of Michigan C Grant, who's the uh, administrator of the Integrated Assessment Research Project. Um, and we're in the process right now then of extending EGLE's grant with the University of Michigan so that our grant makes that funding available through um, the entire process for not only that one-year extension, but then for C grant to close out their grant. So I think that we're looking at like uh, July of 2024. Um, but we expect that Adam will have his final deliverables and draft form towards the end of the calendar year this year. So uh, we'll have to look at timing and uh, what makes sense given that we have another legislative report for the council. Um, in terms of just a quick update, as Pat mentioned, uh, there were rough drafts of those two, those three guides um, that were shared with myself and another advisory committee just for kind of a, a gut check from us on kind of direction and overall tone. So we did some feedback uh, in December. Um, and then the project team's been working on trying to host um, a few informational meetings with water users or some specific water management areas that were identified. Uh, some of the water management areas were recommended by uh, the agency project leadership team, which includes the Water Use Program, MDARD, um, and our office. And then I think they solicited further input from the advisory committee. Uh, so those informational meetings were held, I think, over the fall and in the winter. And then they were planning to form those initial water user committees, um, hoping to still get those off the ground this year. So. Um, that's the current status of the project, um, and I can follow up with Adam. I don't know if my, my monthly is the right frequency um, for updates, but um, we can certainly talk with them. They do have project meetings, uh, the project leadership team every two weeks, so I'm hoping to be able to sit in on that next meeting. We can, if there's anything to update the council on, we could do that under new topics, but I guess as <clears throat> Emily reported, I think we want to wait and since it's something that everyone's interested in we'll we'll wait till the end of that and then create a new subgroup if we need to if there's been enough time there's probably a lot of turnover in some of the people and there may be new people that are interested so there'll be an opportunity to engage in that after that board is done and just as a reminder to the council there's an advisory committee that was formed for this project and council members were encouraged to express an interest if they were interested in participating in that advisory committee that be sort of directly involved in the project. I think that committee meets uh, one to two times per year. So um, if you are still interested, um, but maybe didn't express an interest before, you can reach out to Adam or contact me and I can get you connected with him directly. Um, and I just want to emphasize that it is a research project, so it's important to make sure that you know, we allow that process to uh, be undertaken. So with that, I guess I'll turn it over um, to you, Jim, if you wanted to share sure. out a new item. Okay, I'm not sure. Well, <clears throat> let me start off by saying that I was recently on a Vertech webinar on Magic for Recharge. Oh, yeah. Which is a very broad topic that overlaps with a number of, not just the water use program, but other regulatory programs. So I'm not sure exactly how that would best fit into our use advisory council structure, but managed act for recharge, there's multiple ways to do that. So seepage lagoons, injection wells, infiltration galleries, or they presented during the webinar, they presented case studies from across the country looking at different trying to address different issues. One was seawater, saltwater intrusion that might have some parallels with the uh, brine intrusion into the marshall formation issue that central Ottawa County is encountering right now. Right. But another one of the untested theories in part 327 is uh, part 327 permit application could propose 
measures to prevent an adverse resource impact. So if somebody were to propose Manchok for recharge, for example, to try to offset, prevent an ARI happening in a water management area, might be another area. So I just wanted to approach that and I'm not really sure how that best fits into the overall structure. Well, it, it kind of tangential to the to the conversation I wanted to have with you that Ottawa County is kind of struggling to see if there's some push we should make legislatively to get a better handle on the management of the Marshall aquifer because they feel like they're kind of got their hands back. So this topic is kind of part of that management strategy. And so I've we actually thought about you know aquifer recharge. There's a EWWA manual practice. There's a lot of um, you know, people have done this before in other parts of the country, so it's not a new thing. Uh, it may be new to Michigan, but I, I do think it's interesting, and I, I'd be uh, happy to take that up. I'm just not sure where it will go and who it would best fit. I think it has some some uh, links to the to the models committee, and um, it's it's an interesting. It's an interesting issue. I don't know how best to, to go from there. Well, the, the topic, how did the department get involved was what was the source of interest? Well, Sarah Pearson, through the groundwater technical team, she's a member of ERTA. So she has sent out periodically. ERTA, I don't know what the <clears throat> acronym stands for, but it's uh, National organi technical organization that puts on a number of trainings and webinars on a variety of technical subjects, and they work pretty closely with EPA Superfund. So they, I got an email with a schedule of all the webinars that they had over the course of the year, and they did have this one a couple of weeks ago, May I talk to recharge that I was on. Uh, I don't think we've had anything in Michigan like that. I think it's the top of my head that we have. But well, when we before we did the second water transmission main in, in Wyoming, we talked about aquifer storage um, as as a solution, but it didn't work out. So we built another pipeline. So you know those those solutions are out there, but if they get into wellhead protection and then reintroduction of of uh, contaminants, and so it does get pretty sticky pretty quick, um, but it is a solution and in some cases it's the best solution. So I think it's worth at least in the situation that you're dealing with is you've got a saline formation right, that right. is intruding up to what people are using groundwater. And even more nuanced is that we don't have local recharge. There may be recharge areas in in the Michigan as a whole, but so locally we can't really do anything to help keep ourselves in balance. And so that's that's the management side that they're struggling with. Um, so anyway, I don't I don't want to take up too much time on this because uh, we're, we're going to get into the weeds pretty quick, but I think it's it's worth a discussion. So maybe Jim and I could have a follow up and we could try to get a little bit more um, clarity as to what we're offering and then we could put a call out and see who wants to get together and tell I mean, there's a lot of work Nationally, there's some parts, right. some parts of the country where this is a huge issue. Yes, right. Most of the desert southwest, the right. Southern Eastern, right. especially Florida. And yeah. Jeremiah Asher's <laughs> research project at MSU kind of skated up to the edge of this when he was looking at the potential for on farm conservation practices to provide aquifer recharge. But where they were lacking was, you know, how do we demonstrate actual recharge as opposed to, hey, it's just a good conservation practice? John's turn. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> you're covering a couple of topics here, and Pat uh, has covered a couple too with Ottawa County because we've been the survey's been working there quite extensively. Uh, number one first is that Ottawa County has a unique soil profile in throughout the county, and one of it is, is that there's not a lot of sand and gravel near the surface where we have runoff where we can get shallow recharge. So. That's one of the things that we've been looking at, at least with the survey and particularly with Joe Bush, who works for the county. Anyway, the, the issue is, is that the 
farmers need to take the water off of their fields. And so there's a lot of drain tiles in some of them. And so the only way they can get the crops to grow, particularly with the natural uh, rainfall, is to drain the field. That way they can have high production. Well, that water comes off either through the ground or it goes into the big ditches. And those of you that have been in Ottawa County, many of the ditches are greater than six feet deep. So what we've been talking about is trying to reuse that water downstream and not let it go into the stream. And so that has been getting some pushback, particularly regulatory, because we're talking about water that has nutrients and whether or not it's nitrates from um, natural fertilizers uh, from animal and or it's the nitrates from the fertilizer they add. So there's been some pushback on using it because the farmers can reuse it on their fields if they can go ahead, capture, either put it into a small basin, which some of them have been doing for years, or to go ahead and pump it up on their field and then let it run off into the next one and then, of course, go to the next one. So that's what we've been talking about internally in Ottawa County is how we can reuse it. But there's a regulatory issue because there it's not pure water. It's water that's carrying either sediment, which, of course, is tra uh, trapped in the ditches, but then you have nutrients that are in there, which are of value to the farmers to use. So once we get to the western part of the state, then we have another issue, which is the heavy sands that are near the surface, which means that we have shallow water that needs to be used, particularly for the blueberry crops and other things. And so you have another issue there where you may not have a clay between the well and the septic systems that you have in those particular areas. So then it becomes another issue of having contaminants from natural people, from people's uh, waste getting into the water. And that's where the houses and other things are an issue. So there's a number of things going on in Ottawa. And then the last one, of course, is the one that you just mentioned as well, uh, Dave, is the chlorides that are being pumped up out of the Marshall Formation, where they've been overdrawing on the water because the Marshall cannot be naturally recharged because there's clay overlying the Marshall between the glacial system and the Marshall itself. So it's not naturally recharging. It's very, very slow. So anyway, with that, we're looking at it. And I think it may be worth, uh, just as Pat had talked about, is we need to have more discussion about what we can do to try and enhance the reuse of the water that's there and don't let it go into the streams because as soon as it goes into the stream, and gets into a quote unquote lake, whether it's a small one or Lake Michigan, then you hit algal booms, which are because it has high nutrient value. Thanks, John. A couple, couple comments. Yeah, there's an awful lot of work being done up at uh, Portsmouth Air Force Base, just north of Oscoda, on uh, PFAS control. And they're using a lot of those techniques of reinjection and infiltration galleries and all that, all those techniques to try to capture the plume, uh, run it through GAC to clean it up and then putting it back into the ground again to try to keep it out of Lake Van Etten or the uh, Sopo River. The techniques and the methods and the procedures that they're using are all being controlled very highly by the state and by CERCLA. And you got a somewhat cooperative Air Force standing in the way of it because they're the ones paying for everything. But looking at what they're doing up there might be some provide some insight to what you guys are thinking about doing in other parts of the state, maybe not on the same scale because they're worried about 6,000 acres of a contaminated Air Force facility. Um, but uh, there's an awful lot of work going on up there and there's hundreds of millions of dollars being spent that might provide some uh, reference information that would be useful to your work. I not right. disagree, not disagreeing because I had looked at that before, but uh, when we're looking at PFAS, they're trying to capture the PFAS before they re-inject it or do something else. When we're talking about the natural runoff, we want to at least be able to collect whatever it is at the least possible cost because it's not a negative impact if we put it back onto the field. The real negative impact is if you let it get into the streams and into the lake. And we know that that's what we're trying to minimize, just using the, the nutrients that are there that from a regulatory standpoint are bad, but from an agricultural standpoint are good because it's not nothing negative that's going on in the field. Isan Ghani uh, and Kurt Steinke and one other researcher uh, just put in a very, very large grant proposal 
uh, for a piece of property that MSU just picked up next to the Bean and Beet Research Center uh, up, up in the Saginaw Valley area. Uh, and one of the projects that they're going to be doing, they're, they're going to be able to separate out research plots uh, on this property and do different water treatment techniques with it. One of the things they're going to be looking at is uh, essentially tailwater recycling, Get, getting your getting your tile line runoff, collecting it in a pond, pumping it back through those tile lines in the summer for irrigation for, the, for that exact reason, to capture the water and the nutrients. So, so for at least from an agricultural perspective, <laughs> that research is going on. We just need a better handle on what does that mean? You know, what, what's the interaction with surface and groundwaters? That, that's great. I, I hadn't heard that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The, the, the proposal just went in last week. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I've got it written down. Thanks. <laughs> I'll follow up with Jim and then we'll uh, I'll report back out on where that's going. Excellent. And there are slides from the ERTEC <laughs> webinar, which I'll talk to Sarah and find out if it's possible. I've got a copy find out if it's okay for me to share those with others that weren't on the webinar. Sharon's always the right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I agree that's super important. And I remember um, John Allen talking about another group in Michigan about a decade ago and recharge technology and development. And so it's been you know, it's been a goal for a while. It's just a matter of finding the right technology and that's scalable. Um, it's an important topic. Thanks. Uh, conservation and efficiency. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to cover the update uh, since Kelly has been uh, unable to be at the last couple of meetings, and Kelly will need you to cover the next one. So we connect. <laughs> um, so our committees continue to meet monthly. Um, can you pull the slides up, please? So we continue to meet monthly uh, first Thursday of each month at nine o'clock. So if you're interested, more the merrier. Um, we've been continuing our speaker series. So uh, in January, we actually had uh, Sh Shaley Biker from Wisconsin's Water Use Program give a presentation uh, and talk with us about their water conservation efficiency program um, and also how they use the Alliance for Water Efficiency scorecard. Um, so that was really beneficial. We record all those presentations for those committee members who aren't able to attend. Uh, we do have plans to invite the uh, state of New York to present at a future committee meeting about their water conservation efficiency program. So uh, they, they've got some innovative projects happening there. If you're interested, uh, reach out to us and we'll make sure to let you know when we have that lined up. Um, we've been, as we do each year, putting together our work plans for 2024. Um, so we've updated our yeah. plan from the list. We don't have any slides from water conservation and efficiency committee. Okay, well, then I'll just do a verbal report out. We did them. I'm not sure what happened. <laughs> um, so in the work plan, some of the things that we're going to be focusing on is continuing progress to implement our recommendations from 2020 and 2022. And um, we're going to be forming an internal work group to take a look at some of our existing programs and policies that are addressing climate, energy efficiency, and decarbonization, as well as water infrastructure uh, and some work to provide funding for underserved communities and try to identify some opportunities where we can integrate water conservation efficiency. So, for example, Material Management Division uh, is going to be putting out or has just recently put out a request for proposals uh, to develop a home energy efficiency program. That may not be the exact title, uh, but we want to make sure that there's a water efficiency component to that. Um, so we're going to be getting that work underway. And then this year will be kind of a big focus around uh, education and outreach types of water stewardship. Um, ramping up our work uh, through our new position with the Office of Great Lakes, our Great Lakes Stewardship Coordinator. Um, some of the things that we're hoping to kind of work on this year, we've got a funny opportunity that we worked on last year that we hope to be releasing. Um, we've also gone after some uh, Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funding to build out some additional phases of our Students to Stewards Initiative. Uh, and then we uh, want to try to get out the door uh, the Water Use Program Story Map this year. So uh, we got some 
big things on our plate in addition to the grants that are underway. Um, we have started the process to talk about 2024 recommendations. We did some um, brainstorming. I guess we did send our slides in, so uh, I have to wait a second. Simon's reminding me, so they were submitted. That should happen. Um, and then uh, we've continued to advance progress on implementation of uh, the recommendations from 2020 and 2022. Um, so this month, we're hoping to finalize our grant agreement with Alliance for Water Efficiency, and this is for the project that's looking at innovative and technological advancements in water uh, sectors and their water conservation efficiency BMPs, with an emphasis around business and industry. Um, but we will be capturing the work that uh, the public water supplies and agricultural sectors are already doing. Um, and then we're still trying to make some progress with our 2020 recommendation related to increasing water conservation conservation efficiency through agricultural sectors and expanding that to include animal in industries. We're on our third attempt through MSU Extension to try to fill the two extension positions. Um, they've lowered the education requirement from a master's to a bachelor's. Um, they're still not seeing the kind of candidates that we're looking for. So uh, I don't know if MSU has already reposted, but they will be reposting those positions. So. <laughs> Any help to promote those opportunities um, or anyone you know might be interested. Uh, it's really hard to hire uh, good talent right now. Um, they are getting the advisory committee that's underway though for that project. So it's been a slow start. Um, those are my updates. Simon or any other committee members that I miss anything and any questions. Simon, I'm looking at the slide here, and uh, Emily, you did a great job at uh, going off memory. I have the slides in front of me, so <laughs> I still have my notes. <laughs> but thanks, Simon. <laughs> Earlier, yeah. to yep. All right, Doug or Laura on the implementation committee update. Uh, we have no update, so we uh, have not met since our last council meeting, so we will get something on the calendar in the near future. Perfect. Exec uh, I'll just add uh, executive committee did discuss briefly uh, if there's a way of trying to be able to find a better and more interactive way to be able to share that spreadsheet of progress on the recommendations. We haven't come up with a good solution yet, so I think for now we're still just going to make that available electronically. Anybody who does have updates or stuff that we haven't captured, um, please do send that to us so that we can so that we can keep up to date on it because we will use that spreadsheet as we start to work on the 2024 report. Um, but other than that, uh, we're happy to send send it out again to anybody who requests it. Otherwise, um, you know that that document is still out there and has been attached to the last couple of meeting notices. Thank you. All right. If we can move on to the next uh, item, A should be Eagle update, and I think maybe I mean I can pass it to you. You can do both, but I know um, you might start with zones of water management areas. That's correct. We can do another one. Okay, well, I've got, yeah, further on slides, I've got the okay. couple yeah, slides on that. Yeah. So, so go ahead and work. Okay. okay. All right. Well, good afternoon. This is this is the program update for Eagles Water Use Program. Next slide, please. I'd like to introduce our newest staff person, Marian Mayer, who's our new SSR geologist. Very you have presentation. Presentation. share a few words. <laughs> Tell us about yourself. Well, I came down from RRD. I worked here. I was on the fifth floor. I worked on the information management section project for about four years, working on their documents. I have a geology degree from Eastern. Excited to be here and work with hydrogeology. Welcome. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, 2020 recommendations, the Michigan Hydrologic Framework. We have a project budget, project schedule, and a project work plan. 
for the Michigan Hydrologic Framework, which now includes the Michigan Integrated Water Management data Database. The grant agreement for that is being drafted currently. The next one, transition probability mapping. Eagle procurement staff is working on the contract for that project. Contractor selected, finalizing the contract. We are waiting on IT reviews from DTMB for the request for proposal for the updating the aquifer properties in the tool recommendation. And also for the recommendation for improvements to the tools user interface. Jim, have you, uh, do you have any way of kind of pushing that matter stuff? It's been sitting there for a long time waiting for a review. Well, the, uh, well, Phil, you want to jump in? There are internal discussions within Eagle, shall we say? Yeah, there are. So I think they're aware of the issue, and uh, I think we'll be able to push uh, short. Thank you. We are trying to expedite it. Okay. Um, as Brian mentioned, Lena and I had had a initial conversations with Brian and Megan about the long-term data collection planning, scope of work. And as he also mentioned, it's going to be a topic at the next data collection committee meeting. We're also working with USGS on new joint funding agreement or JFA for string gauges and miscellaneous stream flow measurements. And Eagle staff are currently identifying wells to be included in the National Groundwater Monitoring Network that's run by USGS. Eagle has a grant from USGS to become a new data provider. So that's a two-year grant, runs out in July 25. And John Esch, who had been the project lead, is retiring as of Friday. So I will be I will be taking that over in the interim and then Sounds we, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. We've got uh, we're using some of the funds from the groundwater proposal for change, the $15 million package to proposal to create three new positions in water resources division, one of which would be a coordinator of kind of all things groundwater related. And the National Groundwater Monitoring Network grant duties would fall under that. And then the other two positions, one is envisioned to be a GIS technical support. And the third position would be a database support. Jim, a quick question on that. There, there used to be a monitoring network that US just kind of handled a number of years ago. Well, that went dormant a few decades ago. Is that being picked up again, or are you looking for a clean call out to look for? A lot of the wells, USGS has some active. Monitoring wells in Michigan, wells bedrock and glacial that they are actively continuing to collect data on. There are even more wells that are inactive that USGS own, and a number of those are the core of Eagle's initial grant to become a new data provider. So the initial grant covers becoming a new data provider to the network, so creating the links between Eagle's database or databases and the National Groundwater Monitoring Network identifying which wells are going to be in that network. We've also been working with IT staff, GIS staff in both within the Eagle divisions and also information management to develop the GIS field templates. So uh, the plan is in the vast amount of spare time that Eagle staff have if they're out in the area they go to some of these wells that are close by, document the location and the condition of the well, and if it's successful, to start collecting an elevation data and then upload that using those template forms, upload that directly to the National Groundwater Monitoring Network. Future, that's this current scope of work. Um, looking forward, we could apply for future grants to add additional wells to the network, to install equipment in wells like transducers, to repair wells, banding wells, et cetera. Good. 
So that's kind of a little hanging fruit. It's an existing network. Right. So that's one of the the data collection committee meetings. That's one of the things that we're going to be talking about. It's kind of a big picture getting these various efforts. So the National Groundwater Monitoring Network, the council addressing council recommendations, the work that MGS is doing, all these efforts getting them in parallel and pulling together. You do have a question for John Gellich. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I just, uh, uh, probably eight to 10 years ago, uh, MGS looked at what was out there as far as the USGS. It was around 166 wells that had been put in over a period of time. And there were only 16 that were actively being monitored. And uh, we tried to enter into the program, National Groundwater Monitoring Network, to reactivate some of those wells. And, and there was some, I'll use the word pushback. But here's where we're at now is that right now in the mapping program that MGS is doing, we are completing up Ottawa. It's been published. We completed Allegan. It's been published. Uh, in our drilling programs that we're doing, we are installing monitor wells, and that was the agreement that we have now with the state of Michigan, the water division, is that those monitor wells at some point will be put into the network. What we have is, is that uh, Allegan County had set aside some money and our negotiations with them, this is MGS negotiating with them, so that they would then pay for the monitoring equipment and then MGS would just get it installed get it operating, and then let that data then start residing at Allegan. And then as soon as we receive the approval into the network, it would go there. Ottawa County is doing the same thing. They apply to the National Groundwater Monitoring Network. They've installed their wells. And so combined between the two of them, we have around 16 wells that have been put in over the last three years. And so those are in the Ottawa, Allegan County area. And as MGS is drilling, that we'll be looking at those aquifers where a monitor well would be appropriate to have it in that geographic geologic zone. And that's what we'll try to do. And, and our cost is quite effective because we're essentially drilling the hole as a drill hole core hole that we're doing. And once we complete it, we just complete it as a monitor well where it needs to be. So the well is sealed at the bottom all the way up and we complete the monitor well. So the cost rather than being twelve to $18,000 to drill the well, is a nominal cost of somewhere between $2,000 and $4,000 to go ahead and put a monitor well in, which is a, a nominal cost to have the well. And then there's the cost of the equipment too. So just a quick summary, Jim has given it, is just that we're working together where we're mapping right now to try to put in monitor wells in those areas where we have a need to have a better understanding of what the aquifers are. And that's what we're doing right now. And with the funding that we have and the fact that the cost is nominal, it's a win-win for everybody. Thanks, John. And I should note that John Esch, now that he's retiring from Eagle, is going to be, he has been working part-time for MGS, and now he's going to go more or less full-time with MGS. So as your, uh, your Lansing area representative for the uh, two-minute drilling rig franchise. <laughs> <laughs> and he'll be doing the same things for us that he was doing for you. It's just going to wear a different hat. Okay, next slide, please. All right, I still can't share det many details with you at this time about the Eagle Groundwater Data Management System because of the confidentiality agreement that Ross and I both signed. But I can tell you that a contractor has been selected, that the finalization of the contract is in process, and the target contract start date is in the first quarter of calendar year 2024. Uh, the source of the funding is 7.1 million from the state's IT investment fund. So that is a separate pot of money from the $10 million supplemental appropriation for the council recommendation. Next slide. Just before you go on, this is also there it was ongoing money in the Eagle budget this year to continue to support that effort. Does the budget also, or the, the budget that the governor proposed include the continued funding for Michigan Geological Survey, or is that going to be part of what we need to? I cannot tell you. Okay. I'm not sure. I, I, I found out that it's in there just yesterday. Okay. Good news. 
Yes, it is. Also, I should also say about the Eagle groundwater data management system, the objective is to break down all the silos. So Eagle's got in the various divisions programs. We've got a lot of data, both in electronic format and hard copy format, but it's siloed. So the objective is to create this data management system for all of Eagle, get that populated and make it accessible to everybody. Huge project is going to have to be done in phases. So the initial phase will be take the electronic the data is already in electronic format, get that uploaded. And then in subsequent phase, all the hard copy data scan and upload that. And then initially looking at groundwater as the media, but future phases incorporate other media, so soils, stream flows, what have you. Okay, moving on to Aquabound. So Eagle is and USGS, we're obtaining property access to monitoring wells in Michigan from both private citizens and one of the township governments to have RRD's geological service and section go out and drill monitoring wells. They're located within the predicted zone of influence from Aqua Bounty's post well field. I guess I should back up and say that for those of you who might not be familiar, the Aqua Bounty Project is an aquaculture facility in Pioneer, Ohio, just over the border from Michigan. And they've got proposed well field, high capacity well field. Oops. According to their groundwater monitoring modeling, the predicted zone of influence, about half of it, extends into the state of Michigan. So we want to have our geological services go out and install vertically nested monitoring wells at three different locations within that predicted zone of influence in the state of Michigan. And when I say vertically nested, the deep well would be drilled into the Michindo glacial aquifer. And then if there are any overlying shallow aquifers, then we would have a, a shallow monitoring well installed there. So there's an MOU being developed between RRD and WRD to pay for paying RRD directly for doing that drilling. And the monitoring well drilling is scheduled to be in the second half of June. And happy to say that we're gonna make arrangements with John to have MGS come out there. We're gonna when RRD is done drilling and their recovered core sections will be donated to MGS for their core repository once RRD is done, field screening and enjoy logging. Hey, Jeff, um, yeah. could you remind me, is this just a, a state boundary issue or is this a Great Lakes um, boundary as far as the compact? It's not subject to the compact because the consumptive use is less than 5 million gallons a day. Okay. And they did, the, because the well field is in the state of Ohio, Michigan doesn't have any regulatory authority under 327. Eagle provided comments to Ohio DNR on the permit application. We've had multiple meetings with Ohio DNR. And we, com we also commented on the monitoring plan. Ohio DNR issued the permit. So it's a little bit of a gray area, but they're working well with us. Ohio DNR is still no <laughs> construction on that. And that's still the case. The my latest understanding, there was a court case that was they were contesting right, road right of way access for the piping between the well field okay. and the proposed plant site. And I think it got the denial got overturned on appeal. So I think that's the latest. And we haven't heard that they've started construction. But no, they haven't started construction. So. Thank you. Hopefully we will get the wells in the monitoring wells installed in Michigan and be able to start collecting some background groundwater elevation data before Aquabine starts pumping and then we can continue to collect groundwater elevation data from those monitoring wells to monitor the extent of the cone depression from Aquabine, but also to serve as early warning before 
that might impact private wells in Michigan. Yep. Go ahead, John. All right, uh, Jim, thanks. Uh, you left out probably a couple of key pieces on this. Uh, the one, of course, is the one that it doesn't is not over the five million gallons a day. But the real issue is this is a salmon farm and all they're using the water for is cooling water. And so there's been no discussion of them putting any kind of solar or any kind of refrigeration type units or using, if you will, uh, groundwater cooling of the water and recycling it. They want to use it and then they're going to dump it into a drainage and it's going to go into Lake Erie. And so it's nowhere going to get back into the aquifer, which and I think more of it is in Michigan than it is in Ohio. And it's just going to be gone. It's water that's going to be gone and they don't care. And and that's the concern that I've got. Yeah, thank you. And I'll, I'll say that that's why we raised it um, with the Water Conservation and Efficiency Committee and spelled out like there's a soccer culture issue where there's multiple ways to raise fish. Some of them may, I think some of them that require less capital investment to start up make no real effort to conserve the water at all. It's a, it can be four million gallons a day, just sort of flush through and it's not the only option. So there's this nexus here about like, is that the type that we should be moving towards, even though it may be the fastest one. So I know you guys continue to try to work on that. And I mean, we, you know, we met with the Aquaculture Association Right under the committee, they gave a pretty extensive presentation on you know what's happening in Michigan, at least at that time, and both of them are flow through systems. And just based on that presentation, the business model is just not very sustainable. Um, and the current regulatory framework they felt was not conducive for encouraging growth in that industry. Um, so it didn't look like I think mean, they weren't super interested in looking at water conservation efficiency practices, especially when it's a flow through system of most of their um, most of their industry. So other than like the DNR, you know, hatcheries and things like that. So this was just the private side. Um, so you know, if that circumstance changes, but it looks like from what we can see across the country that either the aqua bounty proposal. That's, there's a significant investment just where the technology is at today for these businesses to get off the ground and we'll see what happens if this one of, you know, ends up moving forward because right now it's on hold. I think there's a pretty distinct difference too though when you're talking about flow through systems of a system in which you are you know water's coming in from a stream it's get, you know it's right. getting diverted it's flowing through back into the stream right as opposed to we're drawing it up from groundwater and then it, you know and then releasing it into surface water you yeah. know it's kind of a different nature of use yeah essentially you know there's no consumptive use for what you know they were showing at least for some of the private sector in Michigan so and it's, it's, it's good to keep your eye on this because even though this one's just across the border spilling into Michigan this this isn't unique. There's other proposals. There's, you know, a proposal that's on and off in this I mean, this is this is their this sort of four million gallons a day pushed through the system from groundwater and then out into surface water. It's, it's not a, a singular issue. If it was in Michigan, what would the regulatory handle be? If it was in Michigan, we would have required a 327 permit application which would part of the decision criteria is that it has to comply with all other applicable local, state, federal, interstate, and international regulations, in addition to the reasonable use, et cetera. So it'd be a much more rigorous review. Um, for one thing, Aquabody did not share their electronic groundwater model files with Eagle, even though we requested it. So it would be an incomplete permit application as far as EGLE is concerned if we got a groundwater model that didn't provide the groundwater model files. But apparently that was an issue for Ohio DNR. Yeah, and Thanks for keeping this up. OK, next slide. OK, the uh, Triple M Vela Pit, Gravel Operation, that's in Arbor Township. 
Yes. So corrective actions to address violations of part 31 soil. Water conservation, soil erosion, part 31 in the Lincoln Stream, 303 wetlands and 327 are in progress. Questions about responses to the water quality and water resources violations should be addressed to our Jackson District Office staff. <coughs> and water use assessment unit, we're currently reviewing a groundwater model for that proposed facility. Next slide. Okay. So this table is a sampling. I won't claim that it's every zone D water management area, but as of February 9th, 2003, this is the status of these particular watersheds with some legends that explain the reason why they are in zone D. So in purple, the light purple there, lavender, what have you, those two water management areas were because of the bedrock auto pass. When the tool was originally designed, the groundwater model was designed with an automatic bedrock pass feature that if the proposed withdrawal was in a bedrock aquifer in the central part of the state. So for example, the Saginaw Formation, the Marshall Formation, the thought process at the time was that those aquifers are not hydraulically connected to surface water, and therefore they would get an automatic pass. Well, that's not true everywhere. For example, in the Marshall area, there is a hydraulic connection between the Marshall Formation Bedrock Aquifer and surface water and the shallow water aquifer. So subsequently, that auto pass feature was discontinued and those deflations were reassessed, which caused those particular water management areas to go into zone D. The ones in red, the original index flow that was estimated by the tool when we got site-specific review and did index flow review came back with a much lower index flow. The ones in light green were based on corrected applications of the half max rule. Um, Player Austin, you want to provide any further explanation about that? Yeah, I mean, essentially, you could have a withdrawal in between two stream segments, two different watersheds. And because it's closer to one and it has different properties, let's say it depletes that one 100 GPM, but the other one's depleted 49 GPM. That one wasn't picked up. So 49 GPM is a large depletion amount, but it was never picked up because the tool applied this uh, half max rule. So when we go back and do the review, we correct that and add depletions. So you re recalculated depletion once. Yeah. Disregarding that half max rule. That may not be the most accurate way to do. You have a better idea? Or? Well, I mean, to, if you want to abandon the half max rule, you should at least recalculate. Um, what it would be, it's unlikely that uh, all of the depletions that show that are dropped in the max rule, it would be depletions. You would have depletion of that amount. You should recalculate based on the water sites that you think there's going to be a depletion at. That'd be the minimum. Fine discussion to continue potentially with the work yeah. <laughs> Can be revisited in the work group. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Then there's adjacent stream truncation, watershed delineation error. Next slide. So of those water management areas, Eagle and W and USGS are currently collecting stream flow measurements. So where you see the blue border. Osborne Drain, there is a USGS continuous stream flow gauge installed in that water management area. Water management areas that are, have the red boundary, 
those are water management areas where USGS is going out and collecting miscellaneous stream flow measurements. And the ones at the green boundary are the ones where Eagle, Eagle staff are going out and collecting miscellaneous stream flow measurements. So that is one of our initial responses to how are we going to address these zone D water management areas? We're going to be when we the next council meeting in April, we should have more detailed discussion right within the unit for developing a plan for how we're going to address these going forward. So we should have some discussions in some of the committees in the interim between now and April, but we'll have they'll be more ready for prime time come April. Yeah, it'd be good to discuss this. So Jim, um, I know that there was, well, I should say in the countryside, I hear a lot of uncertainty and questions about what happens with a watershed when it is in zone D, um, in particular from existing users. You know, obviously, you know, they get nervous of, am I going to be asked to reduce my use? Am I going to have my my registration canceled? You know, what what what's the next step for me as a water user? Can you can you provide some clarification or is this something that maybe we can plan on for the next meeting if this needs a little bit of time to come up with it in terms of what clarity can we provide to water users on Watersheds in Zone D. What does that mean for not new users? We understand those those folks okay. are going to get tonight, but uh, for existing users, right? Yeah, that's exactly the question we yeah. want to get to, and that's where we're starting this data collection to say, well, you know, how much should the data dictate what might happen on the ground? Right. Well, yeah. and from a statutory perspective too, you know, because because the you know as you read the statute, it's like it's. You know, you on a first brush, you're like, okay, now I understand it. And then you start reading it again, you're like, oh, wait a minute, no, this is clear as mud. Okay. <laughs> yep. So I can provide some level of I can provide some level of good clarification now. And then yeah, we need we definitely need to take a deeper dive and come back at the April meeting for a fuller discussion. But there is strict reading of the statute. If once the water management area, the balance is zero or in the negative, tool, no new withdrawals can be authorized either by the tool or by an SSR. Previously, if you have an existing registration through either the tool or an SSR, there is a rebuttable presumption that your withdrawal that has been authorized will not cause an adverse resource impact. Eagle would have to rebut that presumption through a preponderance of evidence, meaning greater than 50% likely that your withdrawal is going to cause an adverse resource impact. What that means practically yet to be worked out. We haven't gone down that road yet. The other thing in the statute is that once Eagle says that there's an average resource in well, way back up a step. The statute provides for water users to form water user committees at any time. Statute requires Eagle to provide notice to all the affected water users in zone C and B cold transitional water management areas that they are approaching but not yet at the point where an adverse resource impact is likely and you know, alerting them that they can form a water user committee. To date, no way formed a water user committee. Those notices have gone out? Yes. Okay. Yep, that's, we see, see them on our site-specific review authorization letters. There's language in there informing them about that. So, once, if, Eagle declares that there is, in fact, an adverse resource impact in a water management area. <clears throat> if there is not already a water user committee formed, then the statute requires Eagle to form some convene a meeting of all the water users, local units of government, other interested parties, 
at that meeting, they have the, the that group has 30 days to come up with their own proposal for how they're going to address them. If they don't, then Eagle can propose a measure, but the water users are not required to follow Eagle's recommendations. So then, if they don't, where do we go from there? Yet another untested theory. So, what it takes to get, we, have, we are not yet at the point where Eagles can say there is an average resource impact. We've got multiple water management areas where the checkbook balance is in the negative. But we have not, that is not sufficient yet to say that there's an average resource impact. What is it going to take for Eagle to say there's an average resource impact? We're having internal discussions on that. We will come back, discuss in committees, and come back to discuss with the council. And we have our plan further fleshed out. Yeah. Pretty, pretty much sums it up there, James. Yeah. I saw that there was some chat going on, and Howard had his hand up for a minute and then put it down. Does anyone have you have questions or follow up or or anything that you want to make sure gets kind of onto the meeting minutes? I was just going to say it's still not first in time, first and right. Right. So if someone has been denied, they still can bring it up to the water user committee and ask to be made space, right? Yeah. Correct. So that is we don't know that mechanism, we, but but we know it's not yeah. first in time, first and right. Yeah. When we send out an SSR denial letter, we list out the available options to the water user property owner, one of which is to form a water user committee. Another option is that they could apply for a part 327 permit, which all they get for the 2000 bucks, really, if there's no new data, is that they have administrative appeal rights that they wouldn't have for an SSR. And Andy, what else am I forgetting? Say that again, Jack. So one of the options of if you get denied for an SSR, there are no, in the statute, there is no administrative appeal right. Okay. There is an administrative appeal right for a permit to okay. All right. 327.23. So they can apply for permit. Right. Okay, I understand. Yeah, so all they get, in fact, all they get, if you don't collect any new additional data when you submit your permit application, then what you had when we denied your SSR, all you get for your $2,000 permit application fee is administrative appeal rights. And even without that, you still got the ability to common law bring a common law right period law action. Right. So yeah, yeah, yeah there's always that. that. So thank you. Um any other, no other questions? Next slide is just a map in case you're wondering where these water management areas are. And that wraps it up. Day two. Good. Um, let's see. Well, I'm going to pause for a second, give people a chance to see if they have any other questions. But the other thing we had listed on the agenda was just whether there is a level of a budget update. Right. You've given a couple pieces during the meeting, but yeah, just that again, I think people know that there is no specific money for the 2022 recommendations in the budget, that there is the money for the ongoing work with you. Um, the groundwater database project. Um, and that is, in theory, ongoing money that we'll be receiving every year um, until further notice. <laughs> um, and again, and that the process really just kind of kicking off today with the very first subcommittee hearings on, on budget. So we're at the very uh, beginning of the project. I'm assuming that, you know, Progress might be a little staggered compared to a regular year just because of the house numbers. So I expect that you'll see once um, a brown mid April, you'll start to see things pick up speed and, and budgets start to move across chambers and things like that. Um, where usually that may happen before spring break, it might just be delayed a few weeks would be my guess, but nothing is telling them they can't move, but we'll, we'll see. And once we hear more, we'll keep you posted. Okay, and then um, John Yelich, if you're still there, you had mentioned that um, you had discerned from the uh, very brief omnibus budget recommendations that uh, your your ongoing for the geologic mapping 
was in there? I asked, I asked our lobbyist, Fred Shibley, and he confirmed with me yesterday afternoon, but I have not seen it because I didn't see all of the text. I just asked him. So if I, I could ask you, if I could ask you a favor, can you yeah. check with your sources? And if you confirm that it is, could you send uh, myself and maybe, you know, Laura and Pat an email with which sections or page numbers of that <laughs> omnibus bill? Just so, so we yes. can make sure that yes, it's in there because if we start doing communications on what we need for the 2022 report, I want to make sure that we're um, differentiating those two and not sort of double tipping when we say the amount that we need, if that makes sense. I, I agree. Like I said, I found out yesterday afternoon, so I will do that. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I was looking Thanks. for it and nothing jumped out super I, easy to discern, so. I will Thank verify. You. All right, very good, Brian. Any other questions on the Eagle update? Uh, I got Andy in the room and then Todd online. Todd, no questions, but it's fine. Hey, you're here. You're. All right, yep. Yeah. Um, I don't know how quickly we all wanted to move on from that discussion about zone dewash into the ARI, but I just wanted to, like, there's lots of questions, and it is actually quite complicated. It shouldn't be, but it is. Um, but it's important to note that even though Michigan's you know, water law system hasn't been changed. It's clearly stated in the statute. Administratively, what Eagle can do, if 100% is a, a first and right, first in time, first and right, that, that's the system that's in place. So what the action that Eagle can take, of course, is once that limit is reached, then no further withdrawal can be authorized. The only, the only path forward, like there's some things you can try, but the only real path forward at that point is, as James mentioned, through civil civil litigation or some other kind of common law means of, of sort of pulling an end run around part 327. There still has to be the zone D and the AR limit to adhere to for sure. But um but like Eagle, the state agency is out of that, out of that, out of the middle of that business. It doesn't, we don't have any legal authority to reduce, restrict, change registrations that have already been granted. Even if a watershed is is uh you know suspected or shown to be in the ARI. So it, 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 I want to make sure that those concerns that you hear about the, the you know, is Eagle going to come after a registration that's been granted in the, in the past? There's no legal authority to do that. It um, has to go through civil. So, yeah, with a caveat, that we we're having discussions with our assistant AGs. The state has the same common law rights as anybody else. Sure. In computer. So, in theory, we could bring a common law action Correct. as with anybody else could. So. You know, again, how those two blend together, the statute is very clear that the statute didn't change common law rights. They still both kind of coexist. The exact nature of that coexistence is where we're trying to get a little clarity for folks. And, and I guess, from, you know, from from a pers from the perspective of talking points to farmers, right? Farmers talk with each other. They talk with farmers out west. Even when you're even when in this room, we may understand, you know, hey, when you're saying first in time, first in right, you're talking about the concept of people can get registered until they can't. Right. And then they have to go through some other remedy. I would recommend that nobody from Eagle say first in time, first in right, right. to a farmer because yeah. they're going to freak out all over you. They, they already have freaked out. I, you. Yeah. I, so, you know, <laughs> first in time, first in right implies that out west of the Mississippi, yeah. they're allocating the water down to the last drop, which is not what is done in a recurring rights, correlative rights. Right, and, and, and that's, and that's I'm just bringing that up from a communication yeah. standpoint, that the first in time, first in right means something legally very different than the rights that we they, have they, here they, in they, Michigan. They, and they so I don't want to create more confusion than there actually right. is out in the countryside by by somebody thinking, Oh wait a minute! Are we now moving away from a riparian system? We're not. So, well, I think another thing that was mentioned is that an individual is as to whether they were causing an ARI. It's actually the accumulation of all of them, on the which is part area, of why it makes it so hard which, to determine. Right. Uh, you it, know, if an ARI is being caused, who's causing it? Yeah, <laughs> but, but, I, but I don't think that I don't think that needs to be done. But I think that there's a community community responsibility. It, it is difficult how we can navigate all this, 
But like, you think we can just start talking about some of this? And we'll keep going on it. I think. I think what I heard from Eagle though is that yes, they're not changing to prior appropriations, anything like that. They're not a judge, so they can't do a reasonably balancing test. But they're working through how they view convincing themselves of readiness to rebut a previous assumption of no impact. And what they want to propose is their standards of evidence for rebutting that earlier presumption. And, and we think the common understanding of what evidence would be gathered, what evidence would be used, and would be the basis for any order issued by the department or any further action by the department to the extent that we can build consensus around what that would look like and it's going to help us all in the long term. Yes. So I just want to remind everybody that Eagle put together a couple page FAQ on water law, which is a great refresher when we get into these sticky conversations because they spend a lot of time and effort to make sure the language was accurate. So I just want to put that out. Nobody has is aware of that. It's a good it's a good reference. When was that done? In the last few years. I don't know if it was circulated or published. Is it on the website or where is that? That's a good to bring that up. Yeah. yeah. And Twickle was looking for that. It is on the water use program website. It was released, I think we finished it two years ago now, but it's listed as draft watermark uh, from like November of 2022. So the question was raised to me, is it finalized? It's just came up yesterday. So <laughs> she has to address it. Can we bring that up in the EC and then we'll we'll try to get that circulated yeah. or make sure that that gets out of the Yeah, good to see it. Yeah. It's got the usual, you know, attorney wiggle room language in there. Right. This is not a, you know, legal opinion. This is just our, <laughs> our it's still yeah. it, it, it helps. Direction. It helps put it in context, especially for someone who's not familiar with this area. Yeah. And it, it was shared with the full council for review at the time, at the time that it was developed, and it hasn't changed since the time it was posted. So there's been no further work on it. Right now, it's still going to address water market. It does, yeah. You know, I'll <laughs> inquire internally. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully, it's Thank just you. as simple as I'm clicking that watermark thing. But yeah, the right. uh, extra has a question. Go ahead, Tommy. Uh, uh, thanks. I'm going to keep it right along kind of that same line. Um, there's various reasons for going into a zone D right now, um, not from permitting wells, but more from looking at index flows or re looking at the geology or finding unregistered wells, that type of a thing. Um, but once we get there, you know, and I understand the process, Jim, that you walk through with all the different steps and all of that. I think the commonality in it is how do you make the decision? You know, how do you how do you know how much depletion is occurring? Um, how do we know if we make a change that that fixes the predicted depletion? Um, and as I look and I see, you know, the number of zone D's climbing or they're at least shifting around the state somewhat, you know, we're, we're still in a trajectory where we're still depleting those, uh, accounting system, the water balances, you know, do we have an idea of, you know, there's been internal discussions already, but do we have an idea of what type of data is going to be needed in, or do we have a, timeline on starting to put some of that together as far as the as far as the timeline like i said we're going to we're having internal discussions now we're not ready for prime time here in february by the april council meeting we should have something to take back to the council after having run it through one or more of the committees between now and april so Steve, you're asking excellent questions, Todd. Stay tuned. Great. Well, unless anybody jams their hand up really quickly. I just wanted to point out, I put um, the link to those FAQs um, in the comments, as well as um, Aqua Bounty's timeline and the link to that. So thank you. Thank you. Clay, are you able to capture because uh, there's a bunch of links and a bunch of uh, you know a bunch of documents that folks have put up in in the chat. Are you able to capture that in the recording? I believe so. No, I, it does. It is recording, and there is a transcript of some kind. But I'm just kind of running the PowerPoint. Because I, I, I guess that's 
<laughs> that's what, that's back yeah, I, I, being cognizant of you know any requirements that we've got under Open Meetings Act and you know all of that gobbledygook. I just I just want to make sure that the good conversation and good stuff that people are bringing up and they're putting it into the chat and that's great when you're there in live time but if we can't capture it later it makes it a lot harder to go back and say oh man somebody posted a link to this document and now i don't know where it is or how to find it <laughs> well worst case right Bree, is that as long as while the short term while the team's meeting is still off we can go into the chat open in the document worst case would be we sit download it save it and get back up to the yeah i'm actually doing that right now okay. yeah okay. I was gonna say, so to the if any of the participants that have their computer open you know between now and the end of the meeting scroll through it we'll hit control and click and open up a bunch of screens so you can look at them after the meeting ends we'll see what we can capture but if any participants online um really have something that they want to add for me, that's when I say, does anybody have their hands raised so that we can get your voice, we can get you as part of the minutes comments. Yeah. And so just know that, you know, if you make a really great comment, but it's just in the chat box, we may not really capture that for the minutes purposes and everybody will benefit from that the same way. So um, it's a great thing for links and those supporting things. Make sure you try to grab them before the end of the meeting, but make sure that if you have something that you really want to voice, make sure you raise your hand and, and add it into the, Official. And it might be nice to send those links out with minutes or, or people that are on the distribution list. I, I, yeah, ideally, I'd like to I'd like to do that. And that's why I asked the question is because, you know, normally we don't get a whole lot of activity in the chat, but today it's been blazing. So <laughs> and it, <laughs> well, and it looks like a lot of good, useful links. <laughs> well, it's really core to our, our mission. Yeah. yeah. And John, I, I see John, you've got your hand up. Yeah. It, the Aqua Bounty, I, I opened it, but I can't save it. Maybe it's me, but I couldn't get it to save. Uh, so anyway, that's all I'm saying is that if we can get that so we can have it after the meeting, that'd be great because they make a good summary of the BS that they've been telling everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I, I take Aqua Bounty's timeline as with a grain of salt because, you know, what the company wants a to lot do of and salt. what Ohio DNR wants to do may be entirely different things. <laughs> it's a lot of salt. <laughs> Chris, you had your hand up for a minute too. Did you have something to add to that? Laura, I was just going to tell you we're working on capturing everything as we as we speak. So we'll we'll have all the the information in the in the chat. Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, I'm going to yep. pass it off to Pat. All right, excellent. Well, we're just going to wrap up here with uh, the future meeting dates. Uh, we have April 19th as the the next. I'm sorry. April 9th as the next date. Uh, so, you know, we, I guess forum is about number C, but let me just talk about that. You know, we, we do have people coming from all over. I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on, on uh, checking in for the council members to get forum or making sure you have your alternate, but, um, you know, we do want to keep up with, with our business. And so, uh, you know, the, the summer ones are a little bit harder for us to get Forum, so the spring and fall ones, we'd like to try to get some business done. So I guess I just want to reach out to the council members. If you're not going to be there, please reach out to your, your uh, alternates if you have one or recruit one if you don't. <laughs> so remember that the council's report, next legislative report is due at the end of December of this year. So yeah, important that we have quorums to review and vote on drafts of what's going to go into the report. Okay. All right, so uh, the other dates are listed here. So if there's some reason that we're going to need to reschedule one, we'll let you know as soon as possible. Um, as far as formats, that was uh, regarding the Open Meetings Act. I don't know, Cliff, if you have anything else to follow up. We've had some discussions about how committees should act, and then we were dealing with the, um, uh, the American Disability Act and some of those topics. Yeah, I don't think we have anything further okay. that, other than the fact that if you record a subcommittee member and you want to share it with other members, that's fine. But as we post to the EGLE website, um, then we are, are required to go into ADA requirements and uh, therefore be something that can be transcribed. Great. 
And then with respect to the appointments, I know that there are some that were still waiting for their official letter. I don't know if anybody wants to report out of nowhere. Yeah, I, uh, I got a call out to the set our Senate contact about four four of ours, and, okay. um, and they thought it had already gone through, and so they were going to follow up uh, by next week to track it down. I let them know we were waiting to try to do some governance stuff until there's letters or okay. something, and they they thought everything was good. So hearing that it might not be, they're going to follow up. So okay. it was very nice thing answer right away Perfect. and they're going to pursue the senate ones i think the governor's ones were fine and then the house was just an issue that the groups that a certain person was representing had been switched to maybe two, yeah. uh, two situations my guidance there is to still have those people who had a goof see if you can make it the correction but you still had a letter you're still appointed so for right. a lot of purposes that's pretty smooth for us i think we were mostly waiting to hear that the Senate ones were official before we kind of moved past this. What about so the we'll Eagle ones? No, we realized the governor one may need that as an official letter too, so we're we're following up on those. Okay. Well, the governor ones already went out. Yeah, we had the, the, we I, thought they had. I had the default. I put in my oath of office and all that stuff already. Yeah. Let's say communications could be improved on all levels. Okay. <laughs> so, so I have not been from the Eagles' perspective. Oh, from the director. Okay. Correct. We know. Oh, that's right. There's a director. Yeah. There's a yeah. There are director appointments too. Okay. Okay. So it sounds like governors were the first ones that I saw the press release really on that. Right. Were right. first. House probably fine. Eagle director needs to check, and we should be hearing on the Senate one. Uh, hopefully by next. And that's one where it, it may have fallen between director stairs. Yes, so that's yeah. what you're checking on. I think. Right, too. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, are there any other uh, public comments? Yeah, online. All right. Is there anything else for the good of cause? Otherwise, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. We're out of here. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And if you didn't sign in, be sure to sign in. I'm just a reminder for everybody in the room.